Hey, OpenJS world. Uh, thanks for tuning in to this session. Um, my name is Chris Borchers. I am currently serving on the OpenJS Foundation Board of Directors as the one of the cross project council uh, representatives. Um, and with me, I have uh, Dr. Joy Lisi Rankin, uh, who is the research lead at the AI Now Institute and research scholar at New York University. Um, she's also the author of A People's History of Computing in the United States. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Joy to kind of, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and maybe how you came to uh, write that book? All right. Thank you so much, Chris, for that introduction. And hello, OpenJS. I'm so excited uh, to be a part of this conference. So I am a historian, but I am a historian by way of cryptography and ESL and the video game Oregon Trail. Um, I was a double major in college. I majored in math. I taught myself how to code. I wrote encryption programs, um, but I was also a history major. And after college, I worked in tech. Um, I actually did a bunch of startups that were helping somehow connect education and technology. So one of those, for instance, was doing ESL online on a global scale. And this was sort of before voice over internet was common. We had proprietary software to do that. Um, and after all of that, I finally at some point decided I really missed being in school myself and I went to pursue a doctorate. Um, and as I was studying history of science and technology, which is my area of expertise, I kept reading about tech and computing from the perspectives of like founders and developers. And I had spent all this time working with, I mean, as a developer, but also working closely with users and seeing their creativity and imagination and how they never did exactly what we thought they would do with whatever tech we gave them. And I was looking for stories like that and not finding any. So when it was time for me to write my book, I decided to focus as much as I could on a sort of from the ground up, from the user up perspective of computing. And that led to my book, which is a people's history of computing in the US. Very cool. Um, so you, you mentioned um, sort of you were inspired by uh, in your experience of seeing some of the creativity of um, users of technology and um, I guess could you give us an example of, of some of that creativity that you saw um, in the past and in some of your your findings absolutely and also this lets me talk about Oregon Trail as well so if I forget <laughs> to bring that in um, don't let me forget that okay. um, <laughs> so uh, it also lets me talk about Minnesota which is where I'll start because in the post-World War II decades, so we'll say from the 1950s to the 1980s, Minnesota was the Silicon Valley of the United States. Um, and when I learned that, I was like, what? It's something we never hear about. It's totally forgotten now. But for those 40 or so years, um, especially based in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, there was like a, a thriving, booming high-tech economy. It was based with sort of five key companies, which were Control Data Corporation, Univac, Engineering Research Associates, um, Honeywell, and then IBM had a huge plant in Rochester. And those five companies, but also all of the smaller businesses around them that provided parts, hardware, know-how, created this sort of this state that was, um, my colleague Tom Misa calls it a digital state. And it was also something that was reflected in the community. So parents and teachers were really enthusiastic for their kids to learn about computing starting in the early 1960s. And so around the mid 1960s in the Minneapolis St. Paul area, um, different school districts formed a cooperative to give all of their students, all of their public school students, access to computing. And what I think is really cool about this is at the time, time sharing was a form of, net, form of network computing where um, you could connect teletypewriters, which sort of looked like typewriters with printers attached to them. 
um, you could connect a bunch of teletypes to one mainframe computer. And so in the mid 60s, a mainframe cost literally hundreds of thousands of dollars, whether you were buying it or leasing it. So it was a cost that no single school district could afford on their own. But Minnesota law enabled those school districts to form a co-op so that 18 or 20, and it started with about 20 school districts, it grew closer to 50, they could all share the cost of the mainframe and then just put the teletypes in their school. And the teletypes were connected to the mainframe by phone lines. They ran programs back and forth. Um, all of the students and the teachers were actually connected because, and this is something that was often overlooked, they, because of the phone line connection, they could actually communicate with each other through the mainframe and share programs that way. So starting in the, really the 1960s, Minnesota had this thriving creative computing community for public school students and they were writing programs. They were using BASIC, um, which is the programming language that was huge in schools from the 60s through the 90s at least. Um, and just doing all sorts of amazing things. And as there, that was just one network in the Minneapolis area, there were similar networks that were sprouting up around the state and the state observed this and decided that it would be good for equitable reasons to have a network, um, basically a network of networks across the state to a state to ensure that maybe kids who were in more rural school districts or less affluent school dis districts would also have access to computing. Um, so the state organized something called NEC, the Minnesota Educational Computing Consortium, to put together all of these networks and ensure public school computing from kindergarten through 12th grade, as well as community colleges and universities. And that was in place by 1975. And within a year of its launch, something like 85% of students, public school students in Minnesota, were regularly computing, um, which is, is phenomenal. And it's something we totally forget. It's a huge success story. They were all not just doing uh, programs, but writing their own programs, writing programs to compose music and poetry, as well as play games. Um, so, and here we come to the Oregon Trail, which uh, <laughs> I'm a big fan of. I think many children of the 1980s and 90s probably also grew up playing Oregon Trail. Um, and so doing the research for my book, I was so thrilled um, and surprised to learn that it had started, it had originated in the Minneapolis St. Paul schools in 1971 as a game written on a teletype by some student teachers in American history who wanted to teach their kids how to, how learning about um, the Lewis and Clark expedition. And so they programmed uh, Oregon Trail. And when it MEC formed, that software became part of MEC software. It became popular across the state. And then as Apple Computer came on the scene way back in the 1970s into early 80s, one of its biggest customers was uh, school districts around the United States. And all of these schools were looking for software for their apples. And Mac, because it had this huge software repository from like 15 years of Minnesota computing, had all of these games and programs like Oregon Trail that they could, um, they actually did like a subscription service for public schools around the country. And voila, there we go. <laughs> Very cool. Um, no, I mean, I, yeah, I have fond memories of, of Oregon Trail. So, um, and even, I mean, I recently purchased like a little like handheld Oregon Trail, like not too long ago that yes, yes. I was playing with, which was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been, I mean, it's, it lives on like when I, go, I mean, talk to undergraduates about this or like at other colleges or universities, like people have it on their phones. They like, you know, there are different versions of it. They play it online with their friends. So yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, that's amazing. <laughs> um, so uh, to, I guess, um, kind of bring us back to the, uh, the title of, of this session. Um, 
that obviously is a, a uh, an amazing story of um, increasing equity and and serving uh, as many people as possible. And I think you said some eighty five percent, right, of the students. Yes. That's yeah. amazing. Um, I guess were there other networks that um, perhaps uh, were trying to do the same thing and maybe had different outcomes or not so not so good outcomes um, that that you found in your research. I did, I did, um, and this surprised me as well. So um, I uh, did my undergraduate at Dartmouth College, my BA, and Dartmouth was actually the home of one of these 1960s and 1970s networks, um, which I had known a bit about before I started researching the book, but not as much as I know now. Um, but so Dartmouth in the early 60s was um, men only. It's now co-ed, but then it was men only, and it was almost exclusively white. It was very affluent, um, and the two math professors, one of whom later became college president, uh, John Kemeny, and his colleague Tom Kurtz, saw that there was uh, interest in their students in computing, and they just thought it would be good um, citizen training, actually. They thought that computing would be so essential to life in the 21st century um, that all of their students should learn how to do it. So they uh, fundraised and got grants and petitioned the Board of Trustees to build a network on campus initially. And it was a huge hit, um, perhaps not surprisingly to us now, but like the network was launched in 1964. And as a side note, it was programmed entirely by undergraduates. It was like a phenomenal coding. <laughs> um, Thing to learn about, but uh, launched in 64, by 68, 80% of the students not only are regularly using the network, but they know how to write programs in BASIC. So Kemeny and Kurtz had also created BASIC as the programming language to make it easy and accessible and faster to learn how to code using teletypes connected to, excuse me, connected to a mainframe. So, Kemeny and Kurtz see that computing is like, hugely popular with their students and there's interest around New England in from other schools like, oh, can we also do this? So Kemeny and Kurtz uh, create a program that's connecting uh, high schools and colleges across New England and New York with the mainframe at Dartmouth. And in particular, there's a three-year program that runs from 1967 to 1970, where they're focusing on about 20 high schools around New England. And some of them are public, some of them are private, some of them are in like rural, very rural farming communities, some are in elite boarding schools like Phillips Andover and Phillips Exeter. And again, they think this is great, we're gonna increase access to computing, we're going to give more students opportunity. Uh, and on the surface, I thought, wow, this is phenomenal. Like, it looks amazing. They have all of these schools with different socioeconomic levels computing. And then I looked at the fine print. <laughs> and the fine print was that um, all of the private schools on the network had 72 hours a week of computing access, and the public schools only had 40. So we'll say the private schools had about double the public schools um, for a number of reasons, mainly though because they were residential, and in many cases they just could afford more teletype time. Um, and I thought, oh, okay, here's a class difference primarily. Um, but then I looked even further, and most of those private schools are now co-ed, but at the time, like Dartmouth, they were boys only or young men only. So what I realized is this meant that on the surface, it looked like they were increasing access for everyone, but because of the structures in place at the time around education, the boys using the network were getting nearly double the access as girls. Um, and similarly, uh, it was sort of a amplified bias in a way because even though girls were writing programs, like I found records of like one middle school young woman who wrote this a brilliant 
chess program apparently and there were a number of others but they were just forgotten because there were so many more boys and sort of so many more boys in prominent schools who were given attention to so um this was a case where like it looked like everything was set for like tech to do good and like increase access increase community connect people and it ultimately longer term had the opposite effect right right so um i mean that's that's definitely unfortunate i mean it 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 seems like like inadvertently boys were being given more time um but i mean were girls computing i mean were they doing things what did you find where girls were actually creating and and were just I guess. Yeah, ab absolutely. And not, I mean, this is not just girls, but women as well. So um, many girls on the network. Also, it's important to, I should note that uh, there were all women's colleges like Mount Holyoke that were connected on the network as well. And their students were computing. Um, and usually when I tell my, like I've told my students this, they're like, what? women were not in tech. And I'm like, wait, no, 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 wait, actually, in fact, during the 1960s, women had many jobs in tech, like many programming jobs. Um, and the example that I find really compelling that I often share is specifically with the Dartmouth network. There were women working at the computer center. It was called Kiwit, which is where the mainframe was. And they had public teletype terminals, um, but it sort of was the hub of computing life on campus. And there were women working there who were highly educated, like with, with college degrees, in some cases with PhDs or working with P, two PhDs who were programming applications, who were running user services, who were um, doing their own research on computing. So experts in the field, and that was actually the norm for the 1960s. I think just like we forget that Minnesota used to be the high tech hub of the US, I think right now we often forget that in the 60s, actually there were many women who were working in the computing industry. Um, and one of the reasons I think we forget this culturally is, so an example of this is John Kemeny, who I mentioned before is one of the sort of co-founders of this network. He becomes president of the college um, not many years later in the late 60s, early 70s. And he's giving a speech about how phenomenal this network is. And soon he expects everybody will have a computer in their homes. Um, and it'll be so great because all of the housewives will be able to program their grocery lists and their chores to optimize their days. And then in their free time, they can like take online courses for their like, self-improvement. And so he's giving this speech, which is both, I find hilarious and sad because he's like predicting a future that's in some ways very familiar. Um, but he's completely ignoring the fact that like his network is being run by women, or at, at least we'll say the women are making significant contributions to its programming and success. Um, and he's talking about housewives computing. So sort of doing this like oh, erasure of the work of women's expertise in science and tech. Um, so absolutely, there were girls computing on this network. There were women computing on this network, as well as in Minnesota, as well as on other networks at the time. But that work often is sort of erased, forgotten, not given as much attention to in popular stories. Um, yeah. No, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, I think you, you put it really well in that it's, I mean, it's, that specific story is funny, but also just sad, right? I mean, it's, it's, yes. it's yes. unfortunate, and I'm sure there are many, many, many other stories like that. Um, so, uh, I hate to, like, cut us off, but we are actually, like, almost at time, so. Okay. Um, <laughs> What, um, what would be great, I think, um, for uh, the audience is if you could kind of um, 
just, I guess, give us a little bit of info on how we can maybe um, learn more about these topics. I mean, obviously, go get your book, right? Um, yeah. But uh, um, uh, in addition to that, like for, for people in the community that want to um, be allies and, and sort of help fight these biases um, that are, are clearly still present today, um, what kind of advice can you give on that front? All right. So um, as you mentioned, my intro right now, I'm a research lead at the AI Now Institute at New York University. And we published a report last year called Discriminating Systems. It was a lead authored by my colleague, Dr. Sarah Myers West. Um, and we specifically give recommendations for improving um, in the report improving workplace diversity or tech diversity uh, because the report argues what we've found is that often it is this lack of diversity in tech spaces whether it's gender diversity or having black people and brown people or people with disabilities it's reflected in the kind of systems that get built and the code that gets written and even with the best intentions if we're not sort of taking into account all of this diversity and the way that society is structured, we end up replicating the bias. So um, I would absolutely point people to the discriminating systems report. Um, I'm going to read some of them. And then I will also, in case I forget, I just, there are a number, there are some other books as well that I want to suggest that are just really good places to start. But just some like basics for Proving diversity is to publish compensation levels across roles and job categories broken down by race and gender. Um, to end pay and opportunity inequality, especially for workers, temps, and vendors. And I've been in the tech world, you're all in the tech world. You know there are a lot of people who are doing contract work and temp work. Um, and it creates a hierarchy uh, about who's honored, who's remembered, how they're compensated. Um, increase the number of people of color, women and other underrepresented groups, um, especially at senior leadership levels. And we know like, right, all the research tells us it's not just good for the sort of practice of tech, it's actually good for the economics of tech as well. There's actually like when you have more diversity, you actually end up with more robust um, economics as well. Um, and then for academic spaces, similarly ensure greater diversity in all the space, spaces where uh, we focus on AI research, but really broadly where tech is done, where CS is done, where engineering is done. Um, including conference committees. So those are just a few um, that we actually have many more recommendations. Uh, but I also just wanted to suggest a few books as well. Um, I would go pull them off my bookshelf, but I have, <laughs> um, but that also just go into a lot more depth about how the ways that, uh, I mean, if some of this was eye opening to me, just how bias that you don't you're not even aware of can seep into sort of the spaces that we work in so one is algorithms of oppression by sophia noble um, one is new gym code by ruha benjamin and then black software by charlton McElwain, and programmed inequality by mar hicks so those are very like super well written um, focused on the intersection of diversity and tech, or we could say racism and sexism and tech as well. Um, and just, you know, learn more, um, try to be aware of, you know, wherever you have power, try to think about how it can be used to empower others. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I mean, I'm like, I'm honored to have been in, able to um, have this conversation with you. Um, I'm trying to learn every day as well. So um, I really appreciate you taking the time um, to speak with us. And yeah, um, everyone should, like I said, go go get Dr. Rankin's book and, and the other books that she mentioned um, and, and just learn, be open to learning, listen, um, and yeah, we really appreciate you taking the time.
Thanks so much, Chris. I, uh, it was a pleasure. Thanks.